Hello, welcome. Thank you for tuning in to our YouTube channel today. This lecture is a part of Sea Alaska Heritage's Native American Heritage Month lecture series. The lecture today is uh, the Russian Clinket Conflict of 1802 to 1804, Origins, Course, Results, and it's being presented by Dr. Alexander Vasilievich Zorin, who is the Chief Curator of Collections at the Kursk State Regional Museum of Archaeology in Russia. Dr. Zorin is joining us uh, virtually, so we're presenting this lecture live on YouTube. The lecture is presented in Russian with live translation by Valentina Guk of Juno. Uh, please welcome Dr. Zorin. Thank you. Third time a charm. Hopefully starting recording for the third time will go well. Hello, before we start talking on the topic of the Russian Clinton conflict and about the events that happened at the beginning of the 19th century, I would like to thank those who organized this event and provided the opportunity to conduct this lecture. And I would like to apologize for any proper or location names that will sound different from, from what you're used to hear, because they will be pronounced as we sound them out in Russian language, but not English or Klinket. The history of confrontation between the first Russian explorers of Alaska and Klinket at the turn of the 18th century and 19th century, and mainly in 1802 and 1804, always attracted many researchers and writers. This topic was studied in the 19th century and in the 20th century and even in the 21st century, but with time the number of sources that gave us background to describe those events has expanded, and the standpoints from which these events were evaluated changed as well. Up to the end of the 20th century, historians grounded their opinions mainly and exclusively on the written evidence such as the notes from the travelers, reports of the employees from the Russian-American company, diaries from marine traders, and since the end of the 19th century, oral legends were introduced to the scientific world. And finally, another side of the conflict got the opportunity to forelight and express their opinion about those events. And also historians received the opportunity to compare all the standpoints and, as a result, create an objective picture of the events. Clinket people at the beginning of the 19th century lived over quite extensive territory, which is not different from today, extending from Portland Canal in the south to Yakita in the north, on the islands and adjacent coastal territories of the Alexander Archipelago. And the population of Clinket people was about 10,000, according to contemporary accounts. As almost all travelers and explorers who visited this lands would testify, and also according to the testimonies from the Clinket families themselves, a big role in the life of Clinket people played the war. Every Clinket man from the very childhood started preparing for his future role of a warrior. Beginning from three years old, the boys were taught to tolerate pain, sustain cold temperatures by bathing daily in cold water, regardless of the weather conditions, and as a result, they turned out to be very resilient warriors who could travel long distances in severe weather and could easily resist the attacks of the enemies. At the same time, the war was always an affair of a private clan, or Kwan. In the history of Clinket people, there were practically no known occasions when all people would be involved in coordinated acts against a common enemy. As a rule, the events that happened at the beginning of the 19th century had to do with separate Kwans and certain clans that belonged to them. In most cases, the war developed as a result of family or blood feud. It could happen for a variety of reasons, such as a murder for which no acceptable repayment was offered, fights over women, trespass in hunting lands that didn't belong to someone, protection of trading interests, especially in the 19th century, or simple raids with the purpose to acquire loot or raids to take over slaves. This also had happened. The war could be ended only when equilibrium of losses was achieved. 
for a repayment was made for the killed people that were awaiting revenge. At the same time, we have to take into account that the life of one leader was equal to several lives of people with a different social status. As for the most common weapon, here we see the map of Alaska territory of that time. Along with Russian settlements that existed there at the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th century, the Russians were moving along the chain of Aleutian Islands all the way to Korea, which became their base at the end, and from there, following the coastal area of Alaska, they started moving toward the land of Klinkets. At that time, Klinket warriors were quite serious opponents, not only in relation to the neighboring people like Eskimos or other tribes, but also in relation to Europeans and including the Russians. The most common weapon of Klinkets at the time was the dagger, which was carried around by every man, and as a matter of fact, a man would never detach it at any point of the night or day. And that's where the name of dagger and Klinket language is coming from, from what I understand. It means the thing at the reach of hand, because it is always around. Besides, in close combat they would use spears, clubs, including rock and metal, and also bows and arrows, but bows and arrows very quickly, by the end of the 19th century, were taken out of use because firearms gained the popularity. Firearms were acquired from marine traders, both European and American, and not only guns and pistols or shotguns, but also cannons, though small in size, that they were also used to protect the forts. Besides, the body of the warrior was perfectly protected from all known types of weapons. The head was covered with a helmet, carved from wood, decorated with patterns, painted, covered with animal skins, with a lace of copper and shells, decorated with baleen or human hair. The face was protected with a mask or so-called visor, as you can see here. The helmet depicted an image of a furious man or some spirit or animal, as you can see on the picture, and there were different types of helmets. As for the body, it was protected with a cuirass, a prefabricated cuirass made from wooden planks and sticks that were all fastened together by tendon threads and decorated with totem art. Besides, they were used. They were using bracers that protected the arms up to the elbow, or greaves that protected legs from the heel to the knee. In addition to wooden armor, armor made out of skin was also used. It looked like a sleeveless short that reached the thigh level, and also combat raincoats were used. They went down below the knees and they were made from several layers of animal skins, such as sea lion, elk or caribou, and they were quite successful used in the combat. They were lighter and easier to use compared to wooden armor, and in the 19th century they gradually replaced wooden armor. To make them stronger, they used metallic stripes, as seen in this illustration. Chinese coins that were brought uh, there by foreign traders. So the end product was this leather and metallic armor. We have to mention that the employees of Russian American company were Eskimos and Aleuts, that they, they were the main participants in hunting and combat teams, as a rule were using the same weapons at war as in hunting. It included throwing harpoons, darts, sometimes bows and arrows. They seldom had access to firearms, and only on extraordinary occasions. The weapons of Russian hunting traders didn't exceed clinked arsenals in numbers for quality. In 1803, Russian American company used for military defense copper cannons. Cast cannons were very little in number, and the employees of the company were equipped with a very uneven set of weapons. 
At that time, according to the reports that we have saved to our days, for military defense, they had about 1,500 guns, both smooth bore and rifles. Besides, because the colony didn't have a regular supply of weapons and without a special distribution program, they pass out to people an even set of weapons. They used rifles and muskets, shotguns, sables, army weapons and marine weapons, Asian weapons, Turkish sables and guns and daggers. In other words, Everything traders could bring along, they brought with them. After the first clashes with Klinkit, the commander of the colony, Baran of Alexander, demanded that the management send over chain mails and armors so that they would fight back Klinkit in hand-to-hand combat. Because Klinkit soldiers wore armors, it was difficult to defeat them. Besides, he also ordered cannons and guns with bayonets to be used in hand-to-hand combat. These kinds of precautions were very appropriate because the medical care was basically not existent and any wound could be lethal in the colony. In his conversation with Captain Golovnin, Baranov explained that medical care was at the will of God and if anybody received a dangerous wound or required surgery, most li- likely he would be on the path for death. This type of parity in the armament is one of the characteristics of the Russian colonization in the northwest coast. This, in addition to the fact that the population of Russian employees was not numerous itself in the company, provides a reason and foundation as to why the initiative for military actions came from the side of the Indians. During the entire period of military clashes, Russian-American company only one time initiated the military attack against the Klinkets. It happened when Baranov took a trip to Sitka in 1804. He had to put all efforts together internally in the colony and seek help outside when a ship under the command of Lysiansky was in the nearby waters on the voyage around the world. In most cases, Russians tried to use the diplomacy and they were quite successful in that. The issues of the war and peace among Klinkit people were settled by the council consisting of men of the clan. The attack leader was usually the clan leader or his brother or nephew. They consulted with the shaman, would talk to the spirits, and after that they were ready to organize the attack. According to general accepted rules, the attack on the enemy would take place several months after the formal declaration of war. It gave the opponents enough time to prepare by stocking up on food and building a fortress, wait for the attack or initiate it instead. Instead of storming the fortress, The Klinkis preferred to take them by starvation or by tricking the enemy. Military campaigns as a rule were carried out by the sea. Abbott Anatoly, in his book about Klinkis, wrote that often they would undertake sailing trips similarly to Vikings, covering long distances, and during one day, weather permitting, they could sail 200 miles. The size of their flotilla was quite big, reaching up to several tens of canoes that could carry several tens of warriors. The warriors would quietly sail up to the enemy settlement, land on shore, attack the forts, kill the men, take women and children hostage, and turn them into slaves. Sometimes they decapitated the killed enemy, cut heads and pulled scalps of the head. Sometimes prisoners were tormented and tortured to death. Such cases are well known and described in written sources, and it happened during clashes with Russians as well. Reaching of the peace accompanied by mutual exchange of hostages, their number was usually even and they were called kuakans or deer, since the deer is a meek animal and is very peaceful per Klinkit legends and beliefs. So the first Russian explorers who reached the Klinkit country at the beginning of the 19th century encountered traditional warriors and had to learn the customs related to war and peace and take them into account. The first meeting of Russian sailors with the Klinkets date back to July 1741, when 15 sailors from the packet boat St. Paul went missing in the area of Takanis Bay by the Jacobi Island. Their fate remain, remains unknown, but there were several versions about what could have happened. 
One version is that they were killed by the Klinkets, and according to the other, they were taken as prisoners and remained alive. And the third version is that their vessels were cap capsized by the coast and they all drowned. To this day, we cannot say with certainty what happened. Next encounter happened on June 1788, when a three saints, under the command of navigator Ismailov and Bacharov, entered Yakutat Bay. The encounter was quite peaceful. But we have to say that gradually, as the Russian commercial hunters proceeded to the south, to the land of Klinkids, they were received less and less friendly by the locals. In addition to the company workers devastating their hunting grounds, it was about the fact that many workers were their traditional enemies, Eskimo, Pig, and Aleutians. At the same time, the Klinkids themselves were expanding their interest towards the northern territories, and to be specific, Ayaks were under their influence in the Yakutat area. All this explains the fact why the first encounters with the Russian explorers who visited the territory with exploring and trading purposes were peaceful, and why, after expanding active hunting and establishing supporting bases in the territories of Klinkit by the company, these encounters very quickly led to military attacks. The first clash, however, did not happen because Klinkit were trying to protect their grounds. What happened was entirely unplanned. On the night of June 21, 1792, the warriors from Yakita Kwan went on a raid against the Chukach Eskimos, all of a sudden discovered on Nuchik Island the camp of Baranov, that at the same time was surveying those territories. At night time, the Klinkets attacked the camp, entered it, pierced the tents with their spears, and pierced running out people. Baranov ran out wearing one shirt, and he was immediately injured by a spear pierced through the, his shirt. Even the gunfire could not scare Klinkets easily. When the attack was finally over, Klinkett lost 12 people as they were killed. Russians also suffered some losses as two Russians were killed, nine Kodiak natives were killed, and 15 sustained injuries. After this encounter, Baranov immediately ordered from the company management, like I had mentioned already, more weapons, mail chains and helmets as much as possible, rifles with bayonets as they were needed in dangerous situations, some grenades and a lot, lot of cannons, he wrote in his letter. From that time until the last days in the colonies, Baranov himself wore a chain mail under his clothing that saved his life. This chain mail is preserved to this day. It is kept in the collection of one of the museums. In the period of 1794-1799, Russian hunting parties penetrated deeper and deeper into the country of Klinkit, establishing camps and hunting sites for sea otters. In 1794, Igor Portov and Dmitry Kulikalov were sent to the south as leaders of the party, which included 10 Russians and more than 900 Kodiak natives. They reached Yakita Kwan and ended up taking 12 hostages. These hostages, both men and women, were delivered to Kodiak and were baptized there, becoming the first formal Christians of Klinkit people. This happened in 1794. In 1795, Baranov visited Yakita and then Sitka, and in July of 1796, the first Russian settlement in the Klinkit country was founded in Yakita. In 1797-98, the hunting was conducted in Chatham Strait, the divided Sitka and Admiralty Island, and as, as a result of each trip, about 2,000 sea otter skins were brought back to Korea. At the same time, they encountered quite a big problem because they had to sail back and fall in bad and stormy weather, and often canoes were destroyed during those trips. To solve the issue, to conduct the hunting in a more efficient way without experiencing such big losses, Baranov decided to found settlement deeper in the Klingit country, or more specifically in Sitka. In 1799, he sent over there a large group of Aleuts and Koryaks, two Kaj natives, and of course Russians. That included 550 kayaks and three ships of the Russian-American company, Ekaterina, Eagle, and Olga. 
начале экспедиции произошел... В начале экспедиции был инцидент. В мае 2, 1799, Founded on Baranov Island. The situation with Sitka clan during that time was quite complicated. The most influential and powerful Sitka clan, the Kiksahari, was at war with an equally powerful uh, clan of Deshtan from Futsnum clan from Admiralty Island. Seeing the Russians as potential allies, the Kiksahari leaders agreed to establish a settlement and most likely. They were hoping to receive uh, from Russians weapons and certain military assistance. The winter of 1799-1800 was a troubling time for both Russians and Klinkins, and in order to establish better relations with local people, Baranov started to organize, according to the Klinkins' traditions, celebrations with gift-giving, which was remotely similar to potlatch. Meanwhile, the feud between the Kiksari and the Deshtan came to an end, and two close ties with the Russians became too burdensome for the Sitkins, especially because the other clinkies that came to Sitka from Chilpat, for example, started to laugh at Sitka natives, telling them they became slaves, slaves of the Russians, and that was very irritating to many, including Kiksari. The tension started to rise, and it was really elevated by the Easter of 1800, but due to personal involvement of Baranov, who practically alone came to the settlement of Klinket and settled all the agreements, the bloodshed was prevented. On April 22, 1800, Baranov left for Kodiak, living in the new fortress Medvednikov as the commander. He was a brave man, an executive with great experience, but he failed to prevent the conflict as he didn't have proper skills for that and he could not foresee things and was not familiar with Klinkit traditions. As a result, the conflict between the Russians and Klinkit in 1802 was unavoidable. What were the reasons for the conflict? Despite the fact that Klinkit people had a rich experience dealing with the European people, the relations between Russians and Klinkit gradually worsened more and more, aggravated and finally led to the war. The reasons for the war were seen differently by the participants of the conflict. Among Russians, the most commonly accepted was the idea that Klinkits were to blame. They liked military actions, they liked to take away wealth from others, they wanted to plunder the Russian settlement, and because of that they attacked the Russians, exclusively because of their thrust for prey and because of their innate belligerence. Besides, they were incited by foreign traders, Americans, British, that considered the Russians to be their competitors and wanted to get rid of them using clinkets. This idea was commonly accepted within the Russian-American company and among Russian authors of the 19th century. But some of the witnesses saw the cause in something different. Lieutenant Davidov, for example, who served in the Russian-American company, stated that the behavior of Russians in Sitka could not give the Klinkits a good reputation, for the traders began to take the girls away from them and do other insults. Neighboring Klinkits shamed Sitkin people for allowing a small number of Russians to rule over them and finally for becoming their slaves. They advised them to destroy the traders. These words, by the way, correlate well enough with the information coming from the Klinkit storytellers. Additionally, we should say that the members of hunting teams that came to Sitka were, as a rule, uh, traditional enemies of the Klinkit, Eskimos, Eliots. They robbed Indian burials and fought with Klinkits. At least 10 Klinkits were killed by Eliots in 1802 in Sitka, which is well known uh, from Russian sources. But the reason behind it could be a simple cultural misunderstanding. 
For example, during one of the hunting trips, many Aleuts were poisoned with shells and died. But they thought that the death happened not because it was poisoning, but rather a consequence of a, a witchcraft from Clinkins. And right after that, during a confrontation, those ten Clinkins were killed. Captain Golovnin also talked about the complex reasons for the confrontation. He wrote that the essence of what was happening was the struggle for control over natural resources, if we speak in modern words. According to him, Klinkit saw that Russians, although small in numbers but strong in their weapons, were the people who started to settle along their shores and deprived them of the possibility to continue trade with foreign merchants and the possibility to receive goods in exchange that they desperately needed – fabrics, gunpowder, bullets, firearms, alcohol, finally. The Russian-American company prohibited the sale of weapons, firearms, and alcohol to the Indians. All these items they could acquire only from American and British merchants. American and British merchants required sea otter skins in return. And the sea otter skins were diminishing day by day because Russian hunting parties exterminated sea otters in large quantities. This situation only fueled the conflict. So one of the first and main reasons for confrontation we can consider the fight over the natural resources and the fight to protect their trade and interest that was started by the Clinkets. Besides, as the second reason, we can name those numerous offenses and harassment that Klinkets experienced from encounters with Russians and their hunting teams consisting of Aleuts and LOT. That also played a certain role, worsened the situation and forced Klinkets to initiate military actions. And the third reason often used by the employees of the Russian-American company was the incitement from uh, British and especially American merchants. These facts were well known and are documented, it's not a simple suggestion. Kuskov, in one of his reports from the words of his Indian informants, said that right before the war in 1802, American William Cunningham, who wintered in Futsnu, openly stated that if Klinkets do not destroy the, uh, the Russian fort in Sitka and do not destroy Russian commercial hunting, Americans will stop coming and will cease the trade because they uh, claim it won't have the other's skins for trade. They will have no reasons uh, to come here to trade. This kind of incitement took place without a doubt and also played a certain role. Continuing, these are the main three reasons that we can point out. They caused the war. Summarizing, it is the commercial sea water hunting that infringed on the economic interests of the Indians and induced them to protect their trading grounds. Secondly, all the offenses and oppressions towards clinking by the Russian American company employees and workers, and tragic misunderstandings that happened during the clashes of two different cultures. And finally, the third reason was the instigation of British and American merchants that were competing with the Russian-American company. The first main reasons, of course, were the first two. The third one played a certain role, but was not the main reason. British and American merchants were competing with, between each other as well. And they also didn't have the best relations with Clinket people. There were several occasions when Clinkets attacked the ships of those merchants and robbed them. They could not bring together the competing and fighting clans and direct them to fight against a common enemy. They rather played the role of so-called catalysts that sped up the um, course of events and fueled Russian-American relations. Thus, on the northwestern coast, two different management systems clashed. From one end, it was commercial hunting of sea otters by the Russian-American company, and on the other hand, it was hunting and trading interests of Klinket people. Russian and American merchants pursued one goal and one main profit source, the fur of sea others. However, they chose a different path to achieve these goals. Russians acquired the fur on their own by sending 
their enslaved workers by Belaud, who hunted sea otters in large quantities. And the trade of skins was the second, if not the third place. Americans and British merchants, due to the specifics of their situation, acted on the contrary. They periodically sailed their ships to the shores, conducted trade, bought the fur from Indians and left leaving the Indians with guns, weapons, and alcohol and other European goods, including China, black slaves, anything that could be exchanged during the trade. The Russian-American company could not offer the clinkets anything from the above list. They didn't have many products for trade. It was prohibited to sell uh, firearms and alcohol, and as a result, clinkets could only get those products from the British and Americans. The volume of the trade constantly increased, and Indians needed more and more furs for the trade, more and more skins. And the Russian-American company, with all the activities, created obstacles for the clinking people that couldn't conduct such trade anymore. As a result, commercial hunting for sea otters conducted by the Russian-American company damaged the foundations of economy for the clinkit, took away their main products needed for the trade with the British and American merchants, and the instigation from the side of the foreigners, as previously mentioned, served as catalyst for the developed military conflict. The conflict broke out in summer of 1802. The decision to start the war was made at the large council of chiefs, which took place in the winter of 1802 in Hutnu Kwan, Admiralty Island. Representatives of a number of clans came here. A Kuitoyons Osipen uh, from Tekuyedi and Jiznia from Kluknahadi, Sitka scout lilt with his nephew Kathleen, Kuyons from Ki Kuyu, Sitka, um, Taku and Haida Kaigani and Simshian. They also were there. Additionally, the Tuyons, Haida, Kaigani were distributing among their other participants of the council gunpowder, bullets, and even several small cannons. According to Kuskov, representatives from almost all clans were present there except for Chilkat families, which is interesting because Chilkats were the main instigators whose words were affecting Sitka natives and were upsetting them. In Klinkett's legends, they were the ones that looked like the instigators, whose jokes pushed the Sitkins to attack the Russians. At the same time, according to Sitka legends, Kiksaari Kwan people were portrayed as the main fi fighters for these Russians. All these are um, contradicting and um, against the written uh, sources that we have. We can try to reconstruct the composition of the Clinket Union by clans and clans, basing um, on the information about the settlement of the Clinket clans, as well as um, on the description of the route of the punitive expedition by Baron, who was trying to pacify the Clinket clans in 1804. He moved along the coast in the channel and visited settlements whose residents participated in the War of 1802. Looking at this list, we can try to imagine how many people from which clans and from which settlement participated in that war of 1802. Here we can see the clans of the Raven Moiety that could participate in the war, that includes Lukna Hadi, Hat Kayai, Kuskeri, Kayadi, Kanahadi, Kiksari. That also includes clans from the Wolf Moiety. First, of course, come Kagwantan, and close to them, Gaeshitan, Kadakwari, Ushkitan, Dagis Dina, Shanku Kedi, and so on. Also, Sitkuyeri, Hitlukan, and others.
For Sitka Kwan, it is possible to identify the participants of the battles with the greatest degree of certainty, thanks to the publication of Clinkett legends. By the time the Russian settlement appeared in Sitka, it was inhabited by representatives of three or four clans. There were seven houses of Kiksaadi, Raven, and one house of Gayashitan in the village. An unknown number of Kadakweri also lived there. The historical legends of the Sitka Klinkits also report the participation in the war of Kiksari warriors, the offspring of the Kaguan Tans and Chukanedi. At the same time, Russian sources report the presence of Kaguan Tans in Sitka. Barab Baranov mentions that the most hostile res residents of Sitka were the Kagwantans, with their Toyo name the Scar. In the event of the arrival at the fortress, Baranov advised Medvednikov to take extreme precautions. The apparent disagreement is explained by the fact that the Kadakwari are clans related to the Kagwantans, and the Gayashitan are generally a subgroup in this clan, house group. It is known that small clans often call themselves after the more powerful clans related to them. Most likely, this was exactly the situation in Sitka. All the Sitkinians, both the Kiksadi and so called Kagwantans, took part in the attack on the Mikhailovsk uh, fortress. In, in 1804, they defended themselves from a joint attack by of Baranov and Lysiansky. It is interesting uh, that there is a quantitative predominance in the list of clans of the Wolf clan. It should be noted that according to the Klinket legends, the organizer of the conspiracy was the Sitka Kiksadi, the offspring of the Chilkat Kagwantans. Considering that the Kiksari were not very willing to aggravate relations with the Russians, the decisive role in organizing and rallying the Klinkit forces should be assigned to the influential and belligerent clan of the Kagwantan, followed by the other clans of the Wolf clan. At that time, the Council of the Leaders developed a plan for the conduct of military operations. It was decided that at the beginning of the spring, they would gather soldiers in Angun, and after waiting for the fishing party to leave Sitka, attack the fortress. It was planned to wait for the Sitka party straight and beat them, drown them, and kill them, and at the same time attack the Yakitat party. It was planned that the Yakitat party would be attacked by the Koi warriors with the leadership of Osip. Um, and Jiznia, and for the, this purpose they were gifted with gunpowder and shells. So we can say that the forces of the moiety were skillfully distributed so that the soldiers operated primarily on their territory that they were familiar with and could choose a good um, time and place for the attack. So it was planned to simultaneously destroy almost all group of Russians in the Klinkin country. However, we can say that there was no single common command. Sitka historical legends tell that initiators of the attack were the Kiksari people or Sitka Kiksari. However, according to the Russian, Sitka leaders tried to avoid participation in the attack by all means. It is known that a leader named Shinkitaitz, that was mentioned by Lexdorf in his book, had become an exile among his own people and settled with his family away because he was against the attack on Russians. Saigina, leader um, of uh, elder brother of Kathleen, in a conversation with Lysiansky, also assured that he had no participation plan in, uh, and tried by all means to divert others, and when he failed to do so, he left for Chilkat one uh, so that he doesn't participate in the attack. Among the opponents of the war apparently was Katlaid, the general chief of Sitka Kiksari. He repeated repeatedly warned Medvednikov about the upcoming attack. 
He was not happy with the prospect of conducting hostilities in his territory and didn't want to take all blame and anger from Baranov if something went wrong. However, he could not directly go against the decision of the Great Council. And a few years later, in 1818, Katlian told Captain Golnin that it was his uncle who forced him to fight against the Russians, that he didn't want to do it himself. It is likely that that was the case before 1802 and after 1805. The name of Catalan was never directly associated with any hostile actions. Probably it was the truth. Impressed by the events of 1802 and 1804, historians usually focus on um, Catalan's hostility when he was initial, uh, init initially hostile towards the Russians, but he tried to fight with them by different means. And Kirill Hlebnikov, back in 19th century, without explaining the reason, um, even speaks about the personal hatred of the leader towards Baranov. In the later Klinkit historical legends told by storyteller Herb Hope, uh, the personality of Catlin takes on an epic scale. He's portrayed as a great warrior and um, enemy of the Russian uh, people. However, documentary evidence does not support such views. The analysis of the sources allows us to say that hostility toward the Russians was only a short-term episode in his life. The irresistible force of circumstances pushed both Catalan and Scotland on the pa uh, path of war. They found themselves in a situation that, based on their uh, previous experience, could not be resolved peacefully. Additionally, in order to overcome the hesitations of the leaders of the Sitka Kiksaari, the Council of Chiefs decided that if the Sitka Klinkit residents do not participate in that attack, they will be exterminated. This news directly contradicts the information of the Sitka legends, in which it is the Sitka Kiksaari who initiated the attack. But it is in good agreement with the well-known behavior of the Kiksaari leaders at the beginning of the war. However, a few weeks after the Knutsnov meeting, the interpreters, the Indian interpreters, the Klinkit women with Russian names Daria and Anushka, began to bring disturbing rumors about an attack being planned towards the Russians. However, Medvednikov did not pay attention to that, unfortunately, and didn't take any precautions for defense. However, um, we should not exaggerate scout level's altruism either, because based on the traditional Indian practice of opening hostilities only a few months after the formal declaration of war, he could simply notify the Russians about ending uh, the friendly relations with them and give them an opportunity to prepare, maybe it would be better. In any event, the fate of the fortress was decided. So what was the fortress of St. Archangel Michael in Sitkalai? As a result of negotiation between Baranov and Klinkit leaders, um, the, they allocated a plot of land to the Russians, located in the lands traditionally owned by the Kiksari clan. In the vicinity of the Russian settlements, there were, for example, Katli and Bay. There were the fishing grounds of the family of the leader Katli and were allocated. And these lands were quite important for Kiksari people. Um, the Archangel uh, Michael's fortress was a fortress only in name. It was it was rather a big log house. It was a wooden two-story uh, building. The first and the second floor were uh, connected by external stairways, but internally there, they were not connected. There were no staircases inside. Along the second floor there were outside passages, a gallery covered with wood siding. They had holes to shoot fire on the attackers from top down. On the corners, there were two towers, log structures that had passages in them. Uh, there was a balcony by the main entrance, which was designed for a watch guard looking out towards the sea. In general, that big log house was the so-called fortress of uh, St. Archangel Michael. Around there were several dwellings for elodes, um, household outbuildings. It was surrounded by slingshots, but there were no wooden fences, vestal, or um, ditches around. 
The population of the forces can be divided into four groups, Russians and Creoles, offsprings from mixed marriages, who were employees of the Russian-American company, um, Eliots, Chugaches, um, Kodiakers, um, Eskimos, Aluchi, who lived in Russian industrial parties together with their families. Several Indian clinking females who were wives, uh, maids, and translators, and American sailors, deserters, uh, that um, were about only five people. Um, they were sailors who in 1799 were disembarked from the ship um, Hancock by um, Captain Crooker as a punishment for some actions. And part of them lived in the Russian fort and a couple lived among Clinket. Um, by the way, the sailors are often mentioned as participants of the attack on the Russian fortress, and it's considered uh, that thanks to them it was possible. But the role of the foreigners in various sources is portrayed differently, ranging from simple support of the plan to the incitement to direct participation and sometimes um, leadership in the attack. But it's not quite true. According to the documents, we can say that in summer 1802 in Sitka there were seven American sailors from the Hancock ship. Five of them worked for the Russian-American company and two lived with the Clinkets. Those five died during the attack, and uh, the two survived and were later picked up by British Captain Barber. Most likely they did participate in the fortress attack, but it's not needed to assign them any special role. To set uh, the fire to the wooden barracks didn't require any special European military knowledge. Anybody, not just Europeans, could do it. Besides, according to Indian legends, this arson was carried out by two old Clinket men, and their names are also mentioned. The real instigator of the Indians should be considered not the Englishman Barber, how it often um, happen in Russian literature, but the American Cunningham that we already mentioned. He was clearly in Sitka for a reason. He came there during the attack, most likely to control the situation. How did the military events unfold? On May 19th, the attack on Yakita's party by the leadership of Kuskov's uh, party took place. It happened, as he wrote, um, at the distant Koi land at the mouth of the Alsek River. When they reached the village, it looked unusually crowded and lively. There were many visitors and confrontations began. Fights grew into armed clashes, and the biggest one happened on May 23rd, when a big crowd of Klinkets armed with guns and muskets and long spears attacked the camp of Baranov, but was defeated. Then Baranov, I mean Kuskov, uh, took his party to the opposite coast of the street, but Klinkets followed him and attacked him for the second time, but they lost again. At the end, they started a negotiation with Kuskov and reached a peace agreement. After that, the party of Kuskov returned to Yakita, but they didn't continue with hunting, being afraid of new attacks. They sustained some losses, closed their business, and from there, Kuskov sent a small group uh, to Sitka to warn Medvednikov of hostile behavior of the Klinkit. But this group arrived too late. They came to Sitka when everybody was over. The Sitka party of Ivan Urbanov, numbering about 190 people, set out on the hunt on about, um, on about uh, June 9, 1802. On the night of June 20, the warriors of Kwan Kekuyu attacked um, her um, during their overnight stay in the Frederick Strait, exterminating the party workers almost without exception. Urbanov himself was captured alive, but managed to escape with the help of one of the Eliots. In the forest, he teamed up with seven more surviving Eliots. They went back to Sitka, where they found only the smoking remains of the structure. After that, they continued on their way and reached Yakitat um, on July 21, 1802. 165 Kodiak natives died in the massacre, and this was a very big loss for the Russian colonization, bigger than the destruction of the fortress itself. 
The fortress was attacked on June 16, 1802. The Allied clinking forces of up to 1,500 soldiers attacked and destroyed it. Nobody was expecting an attack on that day at the fortress. Everyone was busy with their daily routine. One party by the leadership of Baturin and Kochisov sailed out to hunt for sea lions, and the Indians attacked them um, from two different sides from the side of the forest and from the side of the bay. When they attacked from the side of the bay, uh, they came in 62 combat canoes. The settlers uh, locked themselves in the barracks and the clinking surrounded it, opened fire, kicked out the doors. Russians tried to fire back, but the barracks were set on fire and those who were inside started to jump out from the second floor. They were pierced with um, spears, killed, decapitated, and then uh, clinking started to rob the storage um, where they kept the sea otter furs. The fortress was burned down, um, burned entirely, and Russians never settled there again. The attack started at about noon, and by the night time there were nothing but ruins from the fire. The hunting party of Baturin was captured on the next day when they were returning to the fortress. They were captured by the dog point. Um, here you can see the dog point on the map. The Russians tried to fight back, especially Vasily Kochisov. The history of his resistance, his capture, torture, and death later was described in Klinkin's oral legends. It correlates to the information from Russian sources. Vasily Kochisov in Klinkin's legends is known um, by the name of Gidak. He was a Creole from a mixed family. His mother was an Elil. And uh, the name of Gidak is a short of Gia Kwan, a name for Elils in Klinkin's language. Survived settlers that managed to escape in the forests um, or were taken as prisoners were later rescued by the efforts of three marine merchants, Henry Barber and American captains William Cunningham and John Abbott. The ships entered the Sitka Bay soon after the attack on the fortress. First to appear here on June 24th was Henry Barber. The British captain rescued several of the surviving settlers and buried the bodies of the dead. Then later, a canoe approached the ship in which were the leaders of Sitkin Clinkets, Cutlilt and Catlian. Barber noted that Catlin's thigh was pierced with a musket bullet. He was injured during the attack. They asked the captain to give them back Russians that they rescued and offered to repay with furs. The Russians, in turn, asked uh, the captain to capture both leaders and by doing so rescue the rest um, of the Russian prisoners. Barber sided with the Russians. He took the Toyons' prisoners, put them in irons, um, and promised to hand them if they didn't release the prisoners and didn't return the captured furs. On the same day, two more ships entered Sitka Bay by the command of Cunningham and Abbott. They came in contact with Barber, and so-called headquarters on board of the ship Globe was formed. And from there, they oversaw the actions against Clinkett's uh, on the ship. When Clinkett tried to attack all those foreign ships, um, the captains would say that they would hang their hostages and um, they would proceed with shooting Indians in uh, canoes with cannons from the ship. And one hostage was indeed hung up. After that, Clinkets were ready to negotiate and started to follow the requirements of these three captains. At the end, on the ship of Barbara, there were three Russians, five Kodiak natives, um, 18 um, females, Eliots, and six kids. They were released by the Clinkets. Uh, they didn't release all prisoners. Some of them were taken to Chilkat and uh, to other Kwans and were released within the next couple of years. In general, the company suffered big losses during the confrontation. In Sitka Fortress of St. Archangel Michael, um, about 
80 people who live there um, out of these people, 32 were killed. Additionally, about 40 people were taken as prisoners, and 28 of them were released by Captain Barber later on. In the Sirka party of um, Urbana, which initially had 190 people, 168 were killed. Not so many survived. And the Yakitat party of Kuskov had the least losses. His large party consisted of 910 people, and only 10 of them died. The survivors returned to Yakitat. In total, at least 203 people were killed. This is an approximation, of course. We don't know how many Aleuts or Eskimos died in Sitka. The real number of killed people is probably at least two. Uh, 20, 30 people more. After the events of 1802, the advancement of Russian colonization in America was put on hold and Russian reputation really suffered. The company was able to recover from the consequences of the uh, catastrophic events ex um, only by 1804 when the ship Neva under the command of Lysansky came to the colony. In May 1804, having gathered the powerful um, militia, Baranov set out from Yakita on a campaign against Sitka. He was followed by Lysansky on the ship Neva. A considerable part of military forces of the Russian-American company consisted of Eleuths and Eskimos that were dependent natives of the company. One of their leaders was um, Nanuk or Nikita in Russian. His uh, portrait is safe to our days and we can see him. On April 2nd, 1804, a party of 300 kayaks headed by Demyanenko sailed on a trip. Two days later, Baranov himself followed um, the party on the Olga ship, accompanied uh, by Ekaterina and Alexander Nevsky ship. On May 25th, they arrived to Yakita, uh, where they were join, joined by Kuskov um, in two ships, Ermak and Rostislav. Along the way, the party probably increased due to the Chugach people who joined them. Baranov moved to Sitka in a roundabout way. First, he wanted to secure his back before the decisive battle, and at the same time, he wanted to intimidate the Klinket people so that they wouldn't come to join the Sitka people. Uh, the first uh, surrender were the northern Kwans closest, um, closest to Yakita, Aku and Huna. Without waiting for the arrival of the Russians, they sent their representatives to Baranov, especially active in the cause of peace negotiation with the famous leader Disney uh, from Aku. In addition to political considerations, uh, he also had person personal motives for this. Uh, the the leader's son was in Russian captivity. The flotilla entered the heart of the Klingit country, and on the way, they were hunting for sea otters. Two settlements in Cape Kuyukwan, from which came the warriors who destroyed the party of Kurbanov, were burned down. And from there, Russians headed to Sitka. By that time, Lysansky on his ship was already there. On July 13, 1804, the ship Neva under the command of Lysansky, arrived at Koryak, and from there he headed to Sitka, uh, where he arrived on August 19th. He anchored in the bay and was approached by other Rus Russians who were already there to support Baranov. In addition to the Neva ship and the company ships, the American brig O'Kane that belonged to the company of Winship Homer and Winship Jr. was there. Captain of the ship was Joseph O'Kane, who came over there to conduct trade with the Clinkets. After staying a while in the bay and have a, having several confrontations with Klinkins, who at first wanted to trade but later started to shoot the fire, O'Kane left the harbor. At the time, one of the Kodiakars who had recently escaped from Klinkit captivity arrived on the ship. Uh, he said that soon there will be passing the leader Kathleen returning from Putsnu Kwan, uh, where he went to replenish supplies of gunpowder. Uh, soon they saw that canoe, and the Kodiak man recognized Kathleen. Lysansky immediately ordered to catch him, and an lone boat was uh, sent after him, by, but they could not catch him. Klingitz, after negotiating with Okin, went back to the village, and Okin left Sitka Bay. 
Finally, on September 19th at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, the approaching company ship Ermak was seen, and Baranov himself arrived to Sitka. Um, and on September 23rd, other main forces of the fishing party continued to arrive. On September 24th, the uh, coast of Krestovsky harbor was occupied by the landing ashore Kodiakars. You can say that it was a temporary military site um, that was formed there. The forces of Baranov initially consisted of 120 Russian commercial hunters and about 900 residents uh, of Kodiak, Chugach, and Elouds under the leadership of uh, 38 Toyons. This includes virtually all of the northern enemies of the Klinkets. Their leaders were placed under strict control by the Russian-American company. Lysansky notes uh, that Toyons consulted to Russian traders in everything. The general leadership of the indigenous troops was carried out by Ivan Kuskov and Timofey Demyanenkov. The majority of the party members were equipped with their uh, long spears, arrows, and other weapons used for hunting sea animals. Although on Yakita, the native allies were given a certain number of guns to be used in um, confrontation with the Klinkets, the expedition was accompanied by four company ships, Ekaterina, Alexander Nevsky, Yermak, and Rostislav. Some people died from illness and some were re uh, returned to Yakita due to illness or to transport the cage, and that reduced the number of the people from 800 to, uh, I mean, to 800 people and uh, 350 kayaks. In total, when Baranov came to Sitka, there were about 920 people there. The backbone of the group were these 20 Russian hunting traders that we mentioned. The party was also armed with three copper falconets, and the ships of the company carried four cannons. Ship Neva had 14 cannons, 46 uh, people were on board, including Lysansky and his officers. According to a number of researchers, the war with the Russians was the business of Kiksari clan alone. However, we believe that combined forces of all clans of Sitka were located, which is supported by the fact that the Indian village was completely empty before the arrival of Russians. There were no inhabitants there. Everybody escaped um, to the fortress that was built nearby. That was a fortress called uh, Shignu. For the Eskimos and Elos, the enemy was considered any clinket, which the Indians perfectly understood. So they didn't try um, to see what would happen and just prefer to hide altogether in the fortress. The same idea was uh, supported by their numbers. According to the calculation of Lysiansky, about 800 soldiers were hiding in the fortress, not counting their family members. It corresponds well with the counts of Sitka residents in regular times. The number of warriors and their families was about the same. The numbers... Um, so the numbers were about the same. Preparing to um, fight back, the Sitka Klinkets, as usual, built a fortress where they um, took refuge with their families. The fortress was a typical example of the fortification art of the Klinkets at that time. Lysiansky describes it in detail. The Sitka fortress was in the shape of an irregular quadrangle with large side facing the sea, um, and it was about 65 meters long. The fence construction consisted of thick logs like a palisade. Below, uh, there were the mass trees, two rows inside and three rows outside, between which um, stuck thick logs, about 10 uh, of them, three meters high and angled outward. At the top, um, they were connected by other thick logs, and at the bottom, they were supported by other support logs. There was one gate and two openings facing the sea, and two gates facing the forest. Inside, there were 14 houses built close to each other. The fence was so thick that not many cannonballs could go through. Similar description is found in the notes of Baranov. The Indian fort was called Shishknu 
or young tree fortress, and it was built from trunks of very young trees. It was located at the tideline near the river, now called Indian River. Russians call the river Kaloshenk River. This fortress occupied approximately 200 square feet and about 1,000 logs went into the construction. The fort was built so that clinkets could dominate on a long gravel bank of the river that extended into the bay. It was hoped that this distance would reduce the effects of the gunfire from the Russian ships, and as the events showed, this hope was fully justified. During the period of preparation uh, for the war, small clashes with the clinkets occurred from time to time. Several Elliots and Eskimos were killed, and the biggest episode involved catching a canoe, which happened on December 29. On December 29, the party workers landed on the shore close to an Indian village, New Plain, Big Fortress. It's the place where um, now Sitka town is located. One of the Klinkit leaders came out to meet them, um, announcing the desire of the Sitkins to make peace. But um, he didn't agree to the proposal to continue negotiations on board of the ship, remembering perhaps about what happened to the people who approached Barber's ship in the past. The hunting traders um, settled down for the night in Clinton barracks, and on top of Nutlin, they founded a new fortress, the future capital of Russian America, New Arkhangels. After some time, a large boat appeared in the distance. This, as it turned out later, was the supreme leader of Kiksari clan, Kathleen, returning from allied Hutsnu uh, Kwan. He took over the organization of the resistance and was now bringing his soldiers um, a considerable supply of gunpowder for the upcoming battle. Still not suspecting this, Lysansky ordered to send a long boat after the Klinkit kayak. Noticing the pursuit, Kathleen went ashore and reached his fortress to the forest, while his canoe continued to escape from Russian. The long boat shot fire towards the canoe, and then it blew up. Some sailors survived, some were caught and taken on board of Neva ship. In his logbook, Lysansky wrote that it was amazing that the sailors could resist the pursuit for such a long time and roll at the same time because some of the prisoners had five wounds in their thighs from gun bullets. Two of the prisoners soon died and the rest were taken to Korea. Baranov ordered to send them to distant sites and use them in work equality to workers uh, like Elliot and in case of mischief, find them. However, provide them with shoes and dress. Basically, they were hired as employees of the Russian American company. Clinket oral legends also talked about this episode. According to this version, the eldest in the canoe was the man called Kagwask, under whose command were three of his young nephews. When they fired back, an accidental spark from the musket um, hit the gunpowder and the canoe exploded. The young man died, but the stunned um, old man was picked up by the Russians and taken prisoner to Koryak where he spent the rest of the war, and after that he returned to Sitka and even composed a song about the death of his nephews. On the morning of October 1, the Neva ship and the company ships were towed by the solution kayaks to the mouth of the Kaloshenka River or Indian River. Over there, negotiations, negotiations began again, and successful continued for more than one hour. Nobody wanted to give in. Seeing the tenacity of the Klinkets, Lysansky decided to scare the enemy with a little shooting. The cannon standard under their cover, a long boat with armed sailors was sent ashore, followed by a boat with um, a four-pound copper cannon. Lieutenant Arbuzov was put in command of the detachment. He was instructed to destroy Indian boats and barns located near the coast. Following the sailors, Baranov landed ashore with his people. The company transported additional cannons to the shore. By 5 o'clock in the afternoon, up to one and, um, 
A half hundred sailors and party workers armed with rifles had accumulated there. They had six, six weapons at their disposal. The Klinkins fired on the Russians trying to unsuccessfully interfere with the landing. The landing was made on the left bank of the river, while the Indian fortress was located on the right. This way, Lysansky and Baranov hoped to protect their people from a sudden clinket attack. They completely succeeded. The river, uh, which was full-flowing and relatively wide at the time of high tide, reliably covered the sailors and party workers who were in the most vulnerable position at the moment of uh, disembarkation. It was decided to start the attack on the Indian fortress at dusk. One of the reasons for that was low tide, during which the stony bottom of the river mouth was almost completely exposed, which made it possible to bring all the supplies closer to the walls of the fort. In anticipation of the appointed hour, they tried to keep clinkets in suspense, firing at them with, uh, from cannons. Arbuzov aimed at one gate and Polyvashin at the other. The shooting was carried out from 3 in the afternoon until the evening, but the Indians didn't express any intention to surrender. The walls of the fortress were so thick that the cannonballs bounced off uh, them. The ship Neva could not approach closer because of the low tide, and finally, um, all they could do was to directly attack the fort. Direct uh, attack was not successful. The Indians greeted them with frequent shooting. Uh, then they tried to go on um, with unexpected sortie. The first Turan were the Kodiak people, led by the famous Toyon um, and Kuk Nikita. They could not resist the attack. One sailor was immediately stabbed by spears. Um, after that, many others ran away in, um, as they were chased. Seeing this turn of events, Lysiansky, covering the retreat, opened fire from the ship's guns, and that stopped the Klinkits, who had to return to the fortress. The turning point of the battle is associated with the sortie of the leader Catlian which was vividly reflected in Indian legends. According to this legend, dressed in battle attire and armed with uh, blacksmith's hammer, uh, he left the fort, entered the river, and walked along the bottom of the shallow Colossian River. He basically attacked the enemy from the back. He was wearing nothing but a loincloth, a helmet, and a strap around his neck holding the hammer. Emerging from the water, he attacked the enemy and gained great fame. During that attack, Baranov was injured, he was shot in his arm, and the Indians even took his coat and a gold chain. Russians lost in that battle. Two sailors from the Neva were killed in the battle, and one more died of wounds on board of the ship. Almost all participants in the attack were wounded. Ten people were killed in the battle, and 27 were injured. The losses of the Indians are difficult to estimate with any precision. Kirill Hlebnik, back in the 19th century, reports that uh, about 30 dead bodies were found near the fortress left by the Klinkit. How many died during the battle or during the gunfire is not known, but the number is consistent with the oral um, Indian legends. According to the Clinkett storyteller Herb Hope, only the point house from which he was born lost about 20 soldiers in the battles of 1804. Reflecting on the attack did not um, alleviate or change the situation of the Clinkett. Lysiansky continued to attack the fort by bombarding it uh, from the ship guns, and the Klinkit re reiterated their desire to conclude peace and even sent out one hostage. At the same time, they agreed to send the rest of the hostages. Negotiations took uh, time and continued until October 6, when finally an agreement was reached on the abandonment of the fortress by the Klinkits. On October 7, there was no life seen in the fortress. Seeing this, um, Lysiansky sent an interpreter to the shore. On his return, he said that the fortress was empty and only two old women and a boy remained in it. The Klinkets left uh, into the forest, leaving more than 20 canoes on the shore. They didn't dare to use them, fearing Russian gunfire. October on October 8, Lysiansky and Baranov entered the territory. 
at last um, they went beyond the walls of the Indian fort. There they found about 100 Russian cannonballs that Indian co collected to shoot back, three cast iron falconets, several abandoned old guns, uh, several empty chests, and up to 50 bear, skin, uh, bear skins. They also got about 30 Indian canoes. Up to 30 dead bodies were found near the fortress. Step dogs were scattered um, along the houses. Of the living, there were only two old women and one boy. There were also the bodies of four or five stepped children. They, they all were boys, one seven or nine years old, and three about four years old. The clinket feared that the barking of the dogs would reveal their secret escape Road. and um, but the reasons for killing the children rem remain unknown. Usually when this fact is mentioned, it is said that they were killed so that their crying, like dogs barking, would not um, lead the pursuit of the trail of the escape. In the Indian legends, references to this fact are rather vague. Um, Alex Andrews was uh, talking about this episode, and he mentions that when Clinkins were leaving, they carried their children along the Indian River uh, when they left the forces in the night. As they were leaving, the children cried, and uh, they said, kill him, they can find us by his voice. In the legend, they called the boy by the name of Slaga Guha, he cries. At the time, um, they were talking only about one child, but there were more than that. Mark Jacobs uh, takes a different view. Before leaving, they decided that the oldest and the smallest would not survive the journey, so the easiest way would be to immediately kill them and get rid of the burden. According to him, this caused a long feud between the Kiksadi and Kagwantans. The fathers of the children and the relatives on the father's side could not forgive these murders. According to another assumption, there were the children of Kiksadi fathers and um, they belonged to the clans of their mothers, the Kagwantans and to Kennedy. In any case, this is a very sensitive topic. Um, in the fortress, most likely there were not only Kiksadi, but also members of other clans, and nobody would tolerate the death of their children. Other storytellers explicitly denied the murder. Herb Hobbs reports the death of the certain number of children and babies, but he attributes it to the consequences of the gunfire by Russians. Andrew Johnson describes the deaths of the children in a completely different way. Um, on the way across the island, many children fell ill. They were very sick and there was no hope of their recovery, and in no case could their dead bodies be carried across the island of Baranov. The Klinkent people loved their children. They would fight for them to the end, but this was a hopeless case. When the children got sick, they were forced to leave them before they died. Others say that um, we were cruel and killed our children, but this is not true. All these legends are very um, contradicting, and we probably shouldn't just believe one of them. The fact that so many contradictions um, exist in the description of this episode um, doesn't make it very reliable because the murder of the children forever would be imprinted in the memory of the whole family. Additionally, there are some other facts that are usually overlooked. Only boys were killed. There were four of them. All of them were um, big enough and couldn't surprise anyone by sudden loud crying. It is unlikely that they were the youngest of all the children in such a large village. In addition, one boy survived with the old women. It is suggested uh, that they were the children of the slaves, but this doesn't explain the reasons for their death. Perhaps there was a uh, sacrifice of some kind, and in my opinion, uh, most likely these were the small Creoles or uh, Enkoriak children captured during the defeat of a uh, Russian fortress, and since then they were living in the position of slaves. Um, they were not exchanged or released. 
Perhaps when the fortress was under attack, um, when clinking were experiencing losses and were enraged by the losses, they could be expressing that outrage um, on those who were already in their position. Because if they were children of clinking women and Russian men, they would be considered the children of their mother family and would be treated differently. These children could be the uh, children of the foreigners um, whose fathers came to kill the clinkies, and maybe that's why they were killed. The old women apparently were really left in the fortress because of their weakness. They, according to their desire, were given a boat by the Russians on which they set off to look for their families. The fortress was given over to uh, plunder by allied and then burned down. The more powerful artillery of the Neva ship and the lack of ammunition among the Klinkets did the job. Klinkets had to retreat, but the retreat was not a surrender. Clashes continued in the coming days, and additional eight allied people were killed in the surrounding base. Therefore, Russians and Elwood had to take precautions. The retreat of the Klinkets remained um, in historic memory as a march of survival. When Klinket crossed in fall without roads through mountains and forests, the entire island, and over the strait to the new location of their settlement and built a new fortress with the help, help of their allies from Kutnu Kwan. Retreat and Katlian continued to resist. Here we can see the losses of the parties in this battle. Baron's party losses, including Russian and indigenous allies, Nivakru, and the losses of Sitka and their warriors, as we can estimate. The exact numbers are not known, and we probably will never find out. So retreat and Kathleen continued his resistance. His warriors attacked separate groups of party members. By spring of 1805, the Zitkinians had already built a new fortress for themselves in Chatham Strait on uh, Chichagov Island. It was named um, Chatla Little Halbot Fortress. The fortress was surrounded by a wooden fence, and the only dry approach to it was covered by huge tree trunks. It was hard to approach from the sea because there was a huge underwater rock that would not allow a ship to come closer. However, in the summer of 1805, Catlin agrees to enter into negotiations and stopped um, active armed struggle. One of the main reasons um, that pushed him to this should be considered the lack of effective support from other members of the Kwan Union. Uh, that preferred to enter peaceful relations with Russians even before. Kathleen arrived to New York Angles in uh, the afternoon of July 28, 1805, accompanied by eight, eight, 11 soldiers. Before landing on the shore, he sent Baranov a blanket of black foxes, asking him to receive him with no less honor than his brother that uh, visited New York Angles a little bit before him. The soldiers carried the leader out of the canoe in their arms, and he stayed in New York Angles until August 2nd, negotiating with Lysiansky and Baranov. They both describe the appearance of Kathleen and his speeches. Thus, the military attack of Baranov and interference in the course of events of the vessel Neva under the command of Lysansky led to the collapse of the Indian Union and the, um, transferred the powers to the hands of the Russian American company. The consequences of this include pacification of the majority of the hostile Kwans, founding of New York Angolsk, and the consolidation of the Russian presence in Sitka. This ends the first stage of Russian Klinkin confrontation and starts the second stage, which is characterized by, by an unstable balance of forces when opponents are um, getting on each other's nerves rather than holding actual battles. Attempts to restore the alliance between Kwans led only to their short term revival and fruitless blockades of new archangels. The biggest event of this period is the seizure of a Russian settlement in Yakita in August uh, 20, 1805. This event was caused by the local reasons and had nothing to do with the general Klinkit resistance plans, but the shock it caused was comparable to the catastrophe of uh, 1802. Soon after returning from the fishery, most of the party led by Demyanenkov was sent back to Kodiak. From the Indians, 
Um, met along the way, the party organizers learned that the Yakita fortress was captured by the Klinkids. Not yet fully believing this message, Demyanenkov decided to sail further and got into the storm. Almost all his party was destroyed, destroyed by the storm. A small number of people reached the uh, shore. Later, he found out what happened in Yakitat, where the village was completely destroyed, and from there he reached Russian settlement in the Hilcherbrook Island. In 1805, according to the most reliable information, about 60 people lived in Yakitat fortress, not counting children and some women, 28 Russians and 35 native workers, 15 of them were women. In addition, Indians living nearby who belonged to a small clan of uh, Klingitized Ayaks, Kohai Tukuyeri or Tukuyeri, were also frequent guests um, of the Russian settlement. Judging by the surviving um, legends, uh, they were often hired by the Russians to perform various uh, household chores. The leader of the group was Tanug, uh, tooth of the sea lion was considered to be a good friend with the leader of the settlement, Larionov. But this friendship was not very helpful to Russians at the end. Moreover, it helped the Klinke to destroy the Russian fortress. Just as in Sitka in the Aleutian Islands, the Russians having taken the Ammonites and feeling themselves masters of the situation, too often allowed themselves to be rude and violent in their relations with the natives. The company never paid the Indians for the last uh, for the land assigned for the settlement and captured local women and Indian workers did not receive any compensation for their labor. Finally, the Russians created an obstruction in the Aval River that prevented fish from spawning and blocked the navigation for canoes. It was the last drop for the Klinkids and they could not tolerate it. Tanuk developed a plan that led to the seizure of the fortress. The plan was based on the fact that him and his people had free access to the fortress and their visits did not arouse aroused suspicion among the Russians. On August 20, 1805, when most of the inhabitants of the fortress were fishing, Tanuk entered the fortress, killed the Russian chief, and gave a signal to his men. They already killed the watchman at the gate by the time, and after that they finished with those who remained in the fortress that day. Then the Indians trapped the returning fishermen, pretending to be helping with fish uh, load, and killed them. After that, inspired Yakitans decided to attack Russian settlement in the Chugach Bay. Uh, that didn't work out, and thanks to Chugach people, the Russian managed to destroy that group of warriors, and their leader committed suicide, and the majority of warriors died. The rest of Tuxayeri started a feud with their neighbors um, and other Klinkit clans, uh, Kluknahari from Akoi, that were jealous because of their they didn't share the loot from the Russian war, and Kluknahari captured the first of Tlahaik uh, to query and killed almost everyone. The Russian prisoners ended up in the hands of the Akoans, and Baranov had to make a lot of effort to secure their release. In Sitka itself, the Indians also stubbornly refused to lay down their arms. The position of the Russians in Sitka remained very precarious, and the sea trade became more and more dangerous every day. The Klinkets always tried to interfere with hunting of the Russians, and um, Russians almost uh, all the time had to carry guns. In March 22, 1806, herring spawning began, began and fresh food appeared in the fortress that helped Russians survive because prior to that the fortress was basically blockaded and it was impossible to leave it. However, spring also brought new worries and new dangers. Many clinkets accumulated in the vicinity of New York Uncles for herring fishing. Many of them were armed, and there was a suspicion that other attack could happen in the newer Congos. The tense situation was somewhat relieved by the appearance of the American ship O'Kane under the command of Winship. The sea merchant, like an old friend of Barnov, tried to alleviate the situation of the colony. He refused to trade with the Klinkets and let them know that Russians uh, had his support and that he would oppose any attacks. As a result, the Indians quickly disappeared across the streets. 
At the beginning of June um, 1806, about 3,000 Indians gathered in Sitka. They surrounded the fortress and started developing plans to attack it. However, fortress inhabitants took serious precautions. They built a sword protective fence and have a notice that Clinkets dropped their plans and started developing new ones. During that process, they fought and argued with, within the group, and their alliance again came to an end, and they all left. In the spring of 1807, the Clinkets met in Sitka Bay again as a large Large group from Chilkats, Tahin, Khunso, Akoi clans. And again, they started the blockade of new Archangels. They managed to capture several female Eliots, and the number of the warriors was close to 2,000. They had 400 battle canoes, and they were excited that Baranov was not there at the time. They considered that. Without him, it would be easier to enter the fortress. The head of the fortress was Ivan Kuskov. He didn't have enough forces at his disposal to openly oppose such large Indian forces, but he decided to split the enemy. Kuskov invited the most respected leader of Chilkat clan to the fortress. He arrived to New York Uncles with 40 people, and in his honor, Kuskov organized a celebration like an Indian potlatch with gifts and food. Chilkat leader confirmed his peaceful intentions towards the Russians, called the Russian friends, and left the alliance. This uh, split the alliance. Um, they were dismayed by Chilkat leader's departure and by him siding with the Russians. Military groups again dispersed uh, around the street after being dismissed. New York Congress was again saved from what seemed almost inevitable. And finally, in 1807, the third stage of the confrontation between Russian and Klinket began. It is characterized by the transfer of the activity of the Indians from the Russian settlements to the Straits, closer to their own fishing grounds. The main target of these attacks uh, became the Russian-American company fishing parties. The Klinkets fundamentally changed their tactics and having come to terms with the very fact of the presence of Russians in their country, they went over to the protection of clan fishing grounds. According to historians of the time, the Klinkin did not provide a pretext for open enmity. They robbed and killed, especially when servants of the, par uh, of the company were moving in the straits, and Klinkets um, were not caught despite careful investigations. They almost never were convinced, and the matter ended only with negotiations and fruitless assurances that it will never happen again in the future. Besides, the Klinkets scattered the sea water shooting by shooting fire in the air, and this way they interfered with hunting of Russian traders. This tactic, which undermined the economic foundation of the Russian-American company existence, turned out to be the most effective. The confrontation in the street led ultimately to pushing the company parties away from there. In 1818, the Russian-American company was forced to go uh, on to an official reconciliation with the Sitka Kaguantans, according to Indian customs, with mutual exchange of hostages. Indians received hostages from the Russian side, that, but most of them were cures or springs from mixed marriages. But nevertheless, diplomatic protocol was followed. Meanwhile, the sea otter fishery gradually declined, both due to the extermination of animals and due to the opposition of clinkets. The company could no longer exist um, only at the expense of uh, extraction of sea animals. New circumstances demanded a more comprehensive development of the region, paying more attention to trade relations with the Indians. Large fishing parties became unnecessary, which means that there was no need to create 45 bases. Therefore, the advance of the Russian-American company to the south and inland of the Klingt country practically stops. The only new Russian settlement on their territory in the redoubt of St. Dionysius in the fr uh, friendly Stahin Kwan rather was a trading post than a base for the merchants, especially because Tahim Klinkets invited Russians to settle in their territory by their own will to conduct the trade. Trade is gradually replacing fishing, and as a result, most of the reasons that caused armed conflicts disappear.
mutual hostility is gradually fading away, and uh, neither side can rightfully call itself among the winners. The Klinkets never achieved their main goals, the expulsion of the Russians from their lands, but the Russian-American company did not achieve uh, its goal either. It failed to break the resistance of the Klinkets and make them completely dependent, as happened with the population of Koryak and Aleutian Islands, and the war in which neither side prevailed ended in mutually acceptable, if not mutually beneficial, compromise. The Russian-American company still managed to gain a foothold on the southeastern coast of Alaska, making profits both from trade and from exploitation of the region national uh, natural resources. It existed until 60s of the 19th century. The Klinkets, taking advantage, advantage of the trade with the Russians, were able to defend both their main hunting grounds and political independence. In addition, um, playing on the contradictions between the Russians, the British and Americans um, took advantage of their buffer position and extended their influence to a number of tribes in mainland Alaska. In addition, they even partially managed to achieve the desired goal by goal. By 1821, the Russian fishing parties were practically driven out of the streets, which had completely returned the control um, of the Klinkitz clans. In the same year of 1821, the chief of Russian colony, Muravyov, allowed the Klinkits to return to the place of their essential settlement near the walls of New Arkhangels. Here we can see the settlement. In addition to striving to improve relations with Indians, he also counted on the fact that having their wives and children and all their property under his guns, he would be, uh, it would be much easier to keep them in check and find out all their plans. The war that broke out as a result of the collision of two economic and cultural structures slowly faded away. How battles in the Straits gave way to a dull confrontation that lasted for decades. However, conflicts comparable in scope to the events of 1802-1818 did not arise anymore, despite all the complexity and inconsistency of further Russian Clinton relations. Undoubtedly, both sides drew proper conclusions from what happened and henceforth uh, try to adhere to certain rules and relations between themselves. But mutual suspicion in these relations remained an inevitable com component of the entire subsequent history of Russian America. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can ask them now. Okay. Thank you for the presentation today. We'll look forward to seeing you in person and live on Wednesday, November 10th. Our next lecture is A Traditional Literary History of the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisterhood, Writing Alaska Native Solidarity into American Modernity, presented by Michael P. Taylor. Thank you for joining us. See you on Wednesday.